yesterday we were talking about the various synthesis techniques for nanocrystalline materials preparation and we have talked about the techniques which start from the vapors and the techniques which start from a liquid and the techniques which start from a solid. So, basically the three sources for the synthesis of nanomaterials. I made a, a slide for you to understand the comparison between these techniques and this gives you some idea of various parameters how we can compare different techniques in terms of either their advantages or disadvantages over the other techniques. Here we are comparing four different techniques. <coughs> One is the modified inert gas condensation technique okay, which is people usually refer uh, as MIGC. Okay. Basically, it is a inert gas condensation technique and has been improved to some extent by uh, controlling the parameters inside to get a, the best possible efficiency of uh, uh, conversion into nanomaterials from the vapor state. And the HEBM is basically high energy ball milling technique okay, which is from the solid state. So, one is from the vapor state, one is from the solid state and the spray conversion technique and the sol gel technique are basically from the liquids. Okay. So, the only difference is in the spray conversion you are basically taking the liquid and forming a spray and then uh, from that getting a nano crystals this is similar to atomization okay. and then sol gel technique is basically a precipitation technique from the liquids. Okay. So, if you try to compare these on a number of parameters starting from what is the smallest size that you can achieve. Okay. We can see that the gas condensation is the best if you want to achieve the smallest sizes because you are starting as I told you it is basically a uh, bottom up approach. This is what we talked yesterday. So, that means you are starting from atoms. So, when you are starting from atoms there is a chance for you to control the sizes to the smallest possible just stop them at the cluster stage itself without allowing them to grow into bigger particles. So, you can even achieve of the order of around 2 nanometers in such a technique. Okay. And ball milling is basically a top down approach we talked about it. So, that means you are breaking down big crystals uh, into smaller sizes. So, there you have limitations in reducing the sizes in, in uh, principle you can reach around 5 to 10 nanometers. Okay. So, it is very difficult to achieve very fine sizes in ball milling. Okay. Particularly, we will talk about ball milling a little later when we are going to talk about mechanical alloying. Here, what you have is when a ball hits a powder particle, there are two processes which simultaneously take place. One is the fracture, okay, the particles fracture into smaller sizes. The second one is what is called the cold welding, okay, because when a particle uh, becomes a small uh, fractured particle, there is a large surface area which is exposed now. Okay. The surface area to volume ratio increases. When the surface area uh, to volume ratio increases, it becomes uh, very reactive and also its uh, surface area being very large, it can get welded to another particle and as a result you have uh, cold welding taking place. Cold welding also occurs with the particles to the balls that are uh, that you are using for communication and also to the container walls. So, there is a, a possibility of cold welding of these particles to particles itself or to the balls or to the container. So, this is one of the basic problems of uh, if you want to say uh, of the ball milling that you not only are uh, grinding them to finer sizes, but at the same time there is also a tendency of the particles to weld to themselves and as a result coarsening takes place. So, simultaneously uh, reduction in the grain uh, size and also coarsening takes place and these two processes simultaneously take place. And depending on the actual conditions of ball milling, uh, which one dominates is what is going to decide whether you get the finer sizes or coarser sizes. If the rate of fracturing dominates, then you will get a finer sizes and how does it depend on? That depends on the conditions such as what is the energy with which you are ball milling and what is the temperature at which you are ball milling. For example, if I uh, do ball milling at very low temperatures, okay. for example, there is a technique called cryo milling. That means, you do ball milling under liquid nitrogen kind of conditions or at temperatures below the room temperature. 
okay. Somehow you cool down the whole container and the uh, balls and the powder. There are possibilities that the whole container can be kept into liquid nitrogen uh, or you can uh, circulate liquid nitrogen through the mid, uh, uh, I mean uh, on the walls of the container, so that you can cool the container. If you do that, we all know that every material becomes brittle at low temperatures. We have a ductile brittle transition temperature for every metal. So, because of that, these powder particles become brittle at these low temperatures and they can easily break. So, the rate of fracture dominates rate of cold welding, because at low temperatures welding cannot easily occur. Okay. So, as a result, you will have more of fracturing taking place. So, one can really reduce the sizes to a very low level. In addition, there is also one more factor which controls what is the size, minimum size that you can achieve. That is the melting point of the metal itself, which you are grinding. If I am comparing aluminum with let us say tungsten, I have taken aluminum powder, ball milling it. I am also taking tungsten powder, ball milling it. Okay. So, the finest size that I can achieve in ball milling is going to be different for tungsten and for aluminum. Why is that so? Because the melting points of these two are widely different and because of that at the temperature of ball milling, ball milling we are doing at room temperature, is not it? At that temperature, uh, whatever temperature that we are using for the uh, ball milling, if that is closer to the melting point of the metal then there is a lot of diffusion that can occur and as a result you have more uh, feasibility for the cold welding to occur. So, as a result if I am melting, I am ball milling low melting metals, the tendency for cold welding is more and if I am mel uh, ball milling high melting metals, then the tendency for fracture is more. For high melting metal is much more, because uh, if I am ball milling at room temperature, room temperature is uh, like uh, we can consider it as a you know uh, cold deformation for tungsten. And if I am ball milling let us say uh, tin or lead for example, okay, it is like a hot deformation, is not it? Because I am already above the recrystallization temperature. So, that controls whether you have more of grain growth and cold welding to occur, so that the grains are going to be coarser. So, one can uh, if you plot the what is ever is the smallest size that one can achieve as a function of the melting point, you will see that there is an inverse relation between the size that you can achieve to the melting point. The higher the melting point, the lower the size that you, one can achieve. So, one has to remember that this there is when I say the smallest size is about 5 nanometers, okay, that is basically for the high melting metals, but if it is a very low melting metal like lead or tin that you are ball milling it, obviously you cannot achieve as fine as 5 nanometers, maybe about 10 or 20 nanometers. So, one has to remember that. Then spray conversion is basically atomization technique where one cannot really achieve very low sizes. Okay. And then sol gel technique is again another technique where it is a precipitation kind of techniques from ions. So, as a result one can really achieve finer sizes as fine as what you probably can get achieve in the gas condensation, but not really so fine, because here you have <coughs> precipitation from the liquid state, whereas in a gas condensation you have precipitation from the gaseous state, where there are really atoms. Uh, or molecules which are in the gaseous state, individual atoms are there. We, as we know in the liquids, there is always a short range order. Because of the short range order, there are already clusters in the liquid, okay. whereas in the gas, you have individual atoms which get separated out. So, one can talk of finer sizes in a gas condensation than any technique that we can think of. Okay. And come to the other major problem of uh, this kind of a technique is what is called contamination. Okay. Contamination from the environment uh, during the pro process of uh, um, synthesis of these nanomaterials, because when you are making a nanomaterial, for example, if you want to make a silicon nanoparticles for some uh, electronic applications, such as uh, maybe some semiconducting applications, you do not want any other element to come into picture, because that is going to affect the properties of it. So, chemical contamination from the environment, whether it is the uh, gaseous environment that you have inside the chamber, which you are using for synthesizing, like a, for example, oxygen contamination or hydrogen contamination or nitrogen contamination, that is one 
problem depending on the type of uh, material that you are synthesizing. For some materials may be contamination may not be a real problem depending on the real application, but in some cases contamination can be a major problem. The other thing could be from the tools that you are using for synthesizing. For example, in ball milling we are using the balls which heat the powder particles to make them final. So, depending on the, uh, the material that we use for the balls, if that balls material is not very hard and if it is soft, there is a possibility of erosion of these balls and that can come into as a contamination. So, so if you look at the contamination, basically gas condensation gives you the lowest contamination, the other techniques always give you contamination. Even for spray uh, conversion, we are basically doing atomization kind of thing using nozzles is not it. So, there can be contamination from the nozzles because high melting liquid is going through the nozzles. So, one can have contamination from there. So, in sol gel technique there can be contamination uh, from the unreacted products ok is basically what you are doing is you are splitting a particular uh, uh, liquid into uh, nanoparticles of a metal and something is left out ok that can contaminate the uh, um, powders. So, that you can have some unreacted products which are left out in the material. So, that is one of the major problems one has to control that. Then comes to composition control ok. We have more or less very good control in most of the techniques excepting uh, the sol gel as I told you because always unreacted products are left out. So, it is very difficult to have a good composition control in such a thing unless there is a way to separate them out very easily. Okay. Otherwise, in ball milling, spray conversion and also gas condensation more or less you can have good control, but the only problem in gas condensation particularly when you want to make uh, compounds. For example, I want to make an ethane aluminum compound NiAl. How do I make a NiAl by gas condensation technique? One possibility is to take NiAl melted ingot which is already melted by some other met method and put it in a crucible, melt it and then allow it to evaporate. And these vapors are allowed to condense on a, your cold finger, but then when the uh, these vapors are condensing the vapor pressure of aluminum and the vapor pressure of nickel are different. Once it is evaporated, okay, the aluminum and nickel are there in the vapor as separate entities. Okay, and these two are supposed to come together and form a again NiAl compound nanoparticles. Okay. So, as a result you may not exactly get the 50 50 composition, but slightly a different composition. So, that is one of the problems and to avoid this people also do another technique that they melt the two separately. So, you have two crucibles inside the chamber, you separately melt uh, nickel at a different temperature, aluminum at a different temperature, two different heaters are provided and then these two vapors go and mix inside the uh, vapor state and then they are allowed to uh, form the nanoparticles, but there also a good control becomes very difficult. So, as a result the control of composition is to some extent is not very easy particularly when you want to form uh, uh, compounds. If you want to form pure metals, there is absolutely no problem and we cannot even talk about composition control in case of pure metals. Okay. Only when we are talking of alloys, then the question of composition control comes into picture. Okay. So, that is something which is important to note. And then <coughs> process control is excellent in most of the techniques, particularly the gas condensation and high energy ball milling. We can control the process parameter very easily. Uh, and spray conversion also it is easier because of the high temperatures that we are using in spray conversion the uh, process control becomes slightly difficult uh, and the sol gel as we uh, see that it is a precipitation technique uh, and controlling the uh, conditions such that only one of those uh, required um, uh, element precipitates is a parameter one has to really control. So, that nothing else precipitates out, but whatever there should be a selective precipitation of what you are interested in. So, that has to be controlled very well. Then the production rate, this is an important thing as uh, for an engineer or for someone who want to commercialize the process. It is very low in gas condensation, 
we know that it is the gases we need a huge chamber to produce a small quantity of uh, uh, nanoparticles there and then ball milling is uh, good but not uh, very high we can produce about 1 to 2 kgs of uh, uh, powder in a day and then you have uh, spray conversion and uh, sol gel techniques which are basically uh, atomization and chemical deposition techniques where one can have larger quantities in principle these two techniques can have uh, higher but at the same time considering the difficulties with the other techniques people do not really readily go into these techniques unless you are specifically looking for one particular type of uh, metal which is easily can be made by these techniques and on a larger quantities okay so one has to always consider many aspects not just the production rate okay in fact uh, next month we are going to have a uh, what is called a uh, one day workshop on how to improve the production rate of ball milling okay so how do we scale it up we are going to come to it in a minute that possibility of scaling up okay it's very difficult in a gas condensation because you know that if you want to really scale it up the chambers sizes that are required are huge and uh, the whole chamber has to be evacuated okay because you have to evaporate the metal so as a result it's very difficult but the other three techniques are much easier and we are looking at what are the problems that we are going to face when you are scaling it up uh, and, uh, to a larger quantities particularly defense people are very much keen to produce these nano composites on a larger scale okay they have given us a big project and they want us to look into the all the aspects of uh, what are the problems that you will face if you scale it up to uh, let's say about 50 kilos or so per day so if you want to do that what kind of a ball mills that one has to consider okay what should be the design criteria of such ball mills and what are the contamination problems that you can face and how to overcome such problems so we are going to have a one day workshop where the experts in ball milling are going to come here we are going to deliberate on that and discuss about this particular problem and come up with some solutions to overcome that they are willing to give even a few crores to set up a plant on producing larger quantities of such nano composites so and production cost if you consider it's very low for uh, the three techniques which are ball milling spray conversion and sol gel sol gel basically you need only chemicals nothing else okay so if you as long as the chemicals are not costly which you are considering it's a very low cost process but gas condensation as you know you need a lot of uh, uh, both capital cost and production cost are going to be very high for uh, the uh, gas condensation technique excepting that gas condensation technique is the only technique when you want to really produce few clusters so that one has to remember that depending on the actual uh, requirement so one has to choose one cannot say that this technique is better than that technique so they are all complementary to each other depending on the type of application one has to think of it okay so then we were talking about various uh, nanomaterials that uh, one can synthesize this is one example of what are called filamentary nano composites one can produce as i told you layered structures this is such a layered structure which is cross section so a layer Uh, structure of for example copper nano layer and silver nano layer okay have been produced and which, which have been sectioned and we are looking at one of those sections and one can do for example in tem what is called a in situ heating experiments have you ever uh, come across uh, characterization using tem if you go to tem there are certain uh, transmission electron microscopes available where there is a, a possibility of heating the sample okay to uh, at least about 700 800 degrees centigrade or so and when you kind of heat these nanoparticles from low temperatures you can really see in situ how these nanoparticles grow okay what is the tendency of these some of the particles have a tendency to grow very fast okay particularly nano crystalline pure metals grow very fast and nano crystalline alloys have a tendency to have a lower growth rates particularly because the diffusivities are restricted when you alloy an element with a, another solute so unless both of them diffuse very fast you cannot have a growth because any grain growth has uh, to be controlled with basically the diffusion rates so as a result if you put either alloying elements which is called solute drag effect okay so whenever you put a solute atom into that 
so the growth rates are restricted because of what is called solute drag effect and the second way of controlling the grain growth is what is called putting some pinning agents which is pop people usually refer to as Jenner pinning effect. Okay. So, when you put some hard particles at the grain boundaries which prevent the grain growth of these particles, we will come to those things a little later. So, this is one such example of silver copper as deposited and heated to 600 degrees in situ. So, what happens how the nanoparticles grow? So, you can see when you heat to around 600 degrees centigrade uh, which is almost uh, more than half of the melting point of silver. So, you still retain about 50 to 100 nanometer particles okay, when you start with about uh, 10 to 20 nanometer particles okay. and one can do in situ various temperatures. Okay. So, the same silver the only difference is silver copper alloy has been deposited on copper here and what we are looking at is the silver copper alloy uh, region. Okay. The, the copper substrate is not shown here and if you look at that heated to 200, heated to 300, 400 and 600 how the grain growth occurs. One can talk about what are called growth kinetics, okay, what are called grain coarsening kinetics, one can do all that as a function of uh, uh, temperature and usually in these materials. For example, if you compare this with the previous picture, this is also 600 degrees and here you have on the right bottom is also 600 degrees. You can see the grain sizes here are much finer than what you see in the pure silver uh, which is deposited on copper. So, that can give you an idea that if you have such a uh, alloying elements induced into the copper uh, into the silver, you can reduce the grain growth. There are also additional advantages. Here is the one case of nickel. If you make a nano crystalline nickel, what kind of advantages one can achieve? when compared to normal typical polycrystalline nickel. If you look at the hardness, the hardness would be about 5 times higher and look at the wear resistance is about 170 times uh, increase you can achieve. This has been experimentally verified and these are the results obtained from the experiments. So, one can really think of a wear resistant coatings on uh, surfaces of some substrates wherever you want to increase the wear resistance uh, with nano coatings of uh, some materials such as either nickel. Nickel is a pure metal, definitely if you can have a compound coated on a sub, uh, substrate, you can have much higher wear resistance. Even with pure metal, if you can achieve about 170 times higher wear resistance, you can imagine definitely with uh, intermetallic compounds or some oxide nanoparticles, you will achieve much higher uh, um, uh, wear resistance. Then frictional coefficient decreases by half. Okay. So, you can have very smooth surfaces without any friction because the grain sizes are very small. Okay. So, you can have much better smoothness as, the, as far as the surface is concerned and once the frictional uh, coefficient decreases, you can have better wear resistance because wear resistance is also connected to the frictional coefficient. Okay. Then corrosion resistance, this is another interesting thing. Though we think of uh, you are making it nano, okay, that means the grain boundaries are increasing, the number of grain boundaries are increasing and we know that each grain boundary acts as a uh, region for corrosion. But at the same time, when you increase such large number of fine grain boundaries, okay, you can improve the corrosion resistance of material. We ourselves have seen in a number of alloys that the corrosion resistance and oxidation resistance of a material increases when you make it nano. Because basically what you are doing is you have definitely each grain boundary will act as an anode, uh, as an anode okay, and corrosion will definitely occur. But corrosion now occurs uniformly throughout the material on a very fine scale. There is no localized pitting that takes place and because of that you can have an improvement in the corrosion resistance of a material. So, one can improve the corrosion resistance okay, and strength obviously increases to a large extent 3 to 10 times the increase in the strength one can achieve and the effects on the magnetic properties, coercivity decreases, resistivity increases and the magnetic saturation, saturation magnetization reduces by about 5 percent and this is one more important thing that one of the major advantages of using nano crystalline materials is for their what kind of a, uh, application? Can you think of the, the first application that one can think of the moment you think of a nano material is uh, catalytic application. 
because you have a high surface area to volume ratio. Forget about drain boundary properties and all. Just using the high surface area to volume ratio, one can think of them as good catalysts. And they have been compared with a number of commercial catalysts. We ourselves have done it in here. Uh, and we see that the catalytic properties are improved to a large extent. I will show you one more slide later uh, of how one can improve the catalytic property. And, and you can see hydrogen evolution uh, can be improved uh, and oxidation reactions uh, or any reaction where catalyst is involved can be improved by using nanocrystalline materials. Here is one example of how a micro material compares with a nano material for hydrogen absorption in magnesium. Okay. So, if you consider a micron sized magnesium and how it absorbs hydrogen, you can see the amount of hydrogen absorbed is very small. Okay. This is the effect of uh, uh, surface area to volume ratio and the moment you make it about 50 nanometers, you can see almost about 5 percent of uh, uh, hydrogen can be absorbed depending on the time <coughs> of uh, absorption. So, if you can have a longer time of holding, obviously you can absorb more, but at the same time there is should be a saturation limit at higher uh, longer time and the saturation limit is of the order of around 5 to 6 percent when compared to almost uh, uh, about 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 percent that one can achieve in a bulk material. So, so one can see that there is a lot of uh, advantages of using these uh, nano materials. For example, uh, you might have heard of uh, uh, the new materials which are coming of batteries which are based on hydrogen absorption, okay? absorption and desorption. People think that this is going to be a new energy source in future where we are going to have problems in terms of the petrol, the amount of petrol being uh, depleting uh, in the surroundings. So, as a result at some point of time maybe about after 50 years or so we may not have any petrol or diesel left out in the earth's crust uh, and uh, under those conditions one has to think of alternate energy sources. So, hydrogen can be one okay, where there are materials nowadays available such as magnesium, magnesium nitride, zirconium alloys. Okay, some lanthanide alloys available which can absorb and desorb the hydrogen depending on the conditions that you are using. So, we can use it as a source like a capacitor. Okay. Capacitor is nothing but basically where you can store the electricity and then give out electricity whenever you want give out. So, same thing like a capacitor you can really use it to absorb all the hydrogen under certain conditions. In fact, there is one professor in BHU, uh, Professor Owen Mohan. Yes, correct. Yes, there is one professor Owen Srivastava in BHU. I have seen in his lab. He keeps a, a motorbike which runs on this hydrogen. He has made a number of magnesium based uh, uh, alloys and which can absorb this hydrogen. So, there instead of a petrol tank, you have a tank containing this material. Okay. So, you have a hydrogen, it is like uh, whenever the you need a hydrogen to be charged into the material, okay, you take it to a filling station, like you take your car to your filling station to fill it with petrol, you fill it with hydrogen. Okay. And once it is filled for a number of uh, cycles, it can work out and once you think that the, because of leakage or whatever it is, the hydrogen is depleted, then you again take it to a filling station, again fill it with hydrogen. Okay. And once you fill it with hydrogen at some point of time during the process, okay, it can uh, dissolve the hydrogen and once the hydrogen is dissolved, that is used for oxidation and then it generates energy and with that energy one can move the vehicle. So, there is a vehicle like that in India itself people have uh, done a lot of work on that. So, these are new things that are coming up particularly with the invention of dianometrials. Okay. Because of these nanometers are available, you can have large surface area to volume ratios, grain boundaries are more open structures, large volume fraction of grain boundaries, one can have large absorption of hydrogen. Only thing that you need is a material which can also dissolve okay, depending on the conditions. If it only absorbs and does not dissolve, you will have a problem. So, if you can change the conditions, it should be able to give out hydrogen and if it can give out hydrogen, we can use that. Okay. So, this is a new energy source that is coming up 
and particularly because of these nanomaterials. We have talked about this. This is again magnetic nanomaterials. There is a lot of work going on on magnetic nanomaterials. Okay. When you come to uh, the nanomaterials, there is some interesting things that happen in a magnetic materials. You know about the traditional magnetic material. What is the most commonly used uh, soft magnetic material? What is the most commonly used soft magnetic material? You all know about it. Iron, iron silicon alloy with about 4 percent silicon. All our transformer cores are made of aluminum silicon alloy. Okay. So, there actually what we do is that we try to uh, grow as big crystals as possible. In fact, there is a process by which you roll it and uh, anneal it uh, to generate coarse grain structures. Why? Because if the grain size is smaller, you have higher coercivity. If you have higher coercivity, the material does not behave as a soft magnet, but it tends to become a hard magnet. Okay, and the hysteresis loop becomes larger. The higher the coercivity means the larger the hysteresis loop. The larger the hysteresis loop means higher losses and these losses result in heating of your magnet during the process. So, as a result a soft magnetic material is always characterized by the smallest hysteresis loop, is not it? So, if you want to have a smallest hysteresis loop, you have to have coarse grain material. Okay. What you see here is a plot on the left side which shows how the coercivity changes as a function of grain size. As you decrease the grain size, you see that there is a d to the power minus 1 type of a law that the coercivity increases with decreasing grain size up to a certain level. level. Till recently when, uh, when the nano crystals have not really evolved, people worked only in that domain where people know only that yes, the coercivity increases with uh, decreasing grain size. And then, so that is why everybody was interested only how to decrease the coercivity by increasing the grain size. But when you come to a uh, region where the grain size comes closer to the domain size, magnetic domain size, then you have because of the thermal excitations inside the material you will see that the coercivity drastically falls. You will have a d to the power 6 type of a law instead of d to the power minus 1 and the coercivity suddenly starts dropping when you come to a nano regime. And now people are able to generate very high magnetization materials, soft magnetic materials with very low coercivity using nano materials, but there is a limit. If you go to very small sizes of the order of less than 10 nanometers or so, you go into another do domain which is called super uh, magnetic, where the coercivity is almost 0 and the material does not behave really as a magnetic material, but it becomes super paramagnetic material. So, because the grain size is so small that it is much smaller than the uh, domain size and yes, amorphous, uh, amorphous material. That is basically because you are using on a special type of materials which are iron based materials which have high magnetization. Okay. So, if you use such materials such as iron, cobalt based, nickel based which have very high uh, magnetization one can really use them. Otherwise usually when you go to very small sizes particularly in the case of hard magnetic materials when you go to very small sizes it does not behave as a good magnet. So, people want to really avoid such small sizes. But again, as you, if you go into amorphous state, as he pointed out, there are advantages. For example, that is one of the reasons why metallic glasses have really prospered and there is a lot of work that has gone into um, by making uh, the metallic glasses, particularly iron boron type of glasses, okay, which have been made as transformer core materials and with a very low losses. The lowest losses that people have made is with those met bulk metal, uh, metallic glasses. Those days there were no bulk metallic glasses, only metallic glasses made up of the melt spinning. Okay. Yes. The inversion occurs basically because when the grain size comes closer to the domain size, okay, when you are talking of about uh, domain sizes are of the order of about 20 to 
50 nanometers, most of the materials okay, or about 100 nanometer depends on the type of uh, processing conditions of course, but it is always less than 100 nanometers the magnetic domain size. So, when the grain size is much bigger than magnetic domain size, within a grain there are a number of domains. Okay. So, as a result the magnetic domains uh, when you apply a, a magnetic uh, field okay, they get aligned into the direction and the grain boundaries do not uh, really uh, increase the magnetization, uh, but at the same time act as obstacles for the magnetic flux to flow and because of which the coercivity increases. But when the grain size becomes almost equal to the domain, each grain becomes a domain. So, as a result that grain acts as a magnetic particle, each ma uh, domain acts as each grain acts as a magnetic particle and because of which the grain boundary effects get reduced and then you will see that the coercivity drops significantly. Okay. So, there has been a lot of uh, studies on a number of materials where people have proved that it comes down. This is the plot that I have shown you is not just for one material, the points that are there on that plot are a combination of a large number of alloys. Okay. So, irrespective of the alloy people have seen similar effect, we have talked about these things. Okay. Let us talk about uh, uh, the solubility, one of the very important thing uh, for a metallurgist. When, when you want uh, an element to be soluble in another element, we have a limitation in terms of the hume rothery rules, is not it? We know that hume rothery rules give us a restriction on what is the solubility limit. Okay. Some elements are able to be dis, uh, soluble in another element very easily whenever the size factor is very small, whenever the st crystal structure of the solute is same as that of the solvent and particularly the other two factors which are the, the electronegativity factor and the valency factor are favorable. So, when you have all favorable conditions then only you get a large solubility, copper nickel is one example, okay. but there are also exceptions such as silver copper where we know that though most of the conditions are more or less satisfying, but you do not get a isomorphous system there, but you get a eutectic system there. Okay. In fact, that is the, uh, the reason for the um, uh, development of a new field called rapid solidification. When we come to the RSP, uh, we will talk about it that silver copper was the starting point for Paul Duve to um, uh, develop this new technique of what is called melt spinning or gun quenching technique. So, we will come to it a little later, but the thing is that as I told you if you can have a larger solubility you have advantage on two accounts, one is that solid strengthening solid solution strengthening can be improved, second you can have a large quant, uh, volume fraction of the precipitates which can give you higher strengthening. So, in order to achieve that people want to have larger solubility, but Hume rather use, rules say that no, no, no sorry this is not possible. Okay, under equilibrium conditions, mind it, it is all whenever we talk of Hume rather rules, they are all under equilibrium conditions. Now, if you can do non equilibrium processing such as uh, rapid solidification or uh, uh, ball milling or any uh, such process, one can have extension of solid solubility. We are now not talking about that, but we are talking about nano crystalline materials that in a nano crystalline material. Okay, because of the large volume fraction of the grain boundaries which are much more open structure than the grain boundary itself, we can have a larger solubility possible okay. and that is what you see in this particular plot that what is plotted is a lattice parameter of a, an iron silicon alloy uh, with uh, different amounts of silicon. If you take different amounts of silicon starting from 0 to up to about 25 percent and plot uh, the lattice parameter achieved during ball milling, this is done by ball milling as a function of uh, in the silicon, what you see is that lattice parameter continuously decreases okay, with a change in the slope at 10 percent, basically that is coming because that is a equilibrium solid solubility. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the plot that you get if it is under equilibrium conditions, but if you take uh, as mechanically milled condition, what you see is those square dots that you see there. So, there is a continuous decrease 
in the sol, uh, lattice parameter, which indicates a continuous solubility of silicon into the iron, suggesting that you can have an extension of solid solubility up to about 20 percent in such a uh, iron without uh, really uh, the Hume Rothery rules coming into picture. Okay. Under equilibrium condition, you cannot have more than 10 percent. What you see the circular dots are equilibrium conditions, which are obtained by heating the same alloy to high temperature. If you heat the same alloy, you lose the uh, extension of solubility. This we know, because extension of solid solubility is only metastable extension. Okay. If I heat it, the second phase, which is in this particular case, the second phase is Fe 3 Si, which precipitates out and then you lose the solubility, extension of solubility. So, but under the uh, mechanically alloyed conditions, because you are producing nanomaterial and you can have a extension of solid solubility. And this can also be seen in uh, a number of systems. This is one example of uh, copper nickel and copper zinc, where we say nano crystallization is a prerequisite for alloying. Okay. If you want alloying to occur, large quantity of uh, solute atom to dissolve into uh, the uh, solvent atom, you need nano crystallization to occur. So, that is the first step, unless it becomes nano crystal, it does not, the uh, solute atom does not dissolve into the solvent atom and that is proved by this uh, plot. You will uh, try to have a look at the right plot, where you see the crystallite size of let us say alpha in copper zinc, what is an alpha phase? In a copper zinc phase diagram, what is an alpha phase? Yes, you all have seen copper zinc, brasses are known to you. Anyone? Alpha phase is a solid solution of zinc in copper, it is a terminal solid solution. Okay. So, look at the uh, crystallite size of the alpha phase, okay, which is shown here that when the crystallite size of the alpha comes to as you increase the ball milling time, okay, the crystallite size decreases and when you reach around 4 hours or so, the crystallite size reaches about 20 nanometers. Okay. The lower values are not really shown here and it more or less asymptotically increases at lower time. So, when you reach around 20 nanometers, you will see suddenly the solubility of zinc in copper suddenly increases. How do you know that this is happening? When you look at the XRD pattern, okay, how do you get this crystallite size? Do you know how to people calculate the crystallite size? From the peak broadening. From the peak broadening, one can calculate the crystallite size. So, if you look at the copper peaks, you will see that as you keep on doing ball milling, the peak broadening increases and the moment the broadening reaches a particular critical value, suddenly the peak starts shifting. The peak shift basically means what? The lattice parameter has changed and why does the lattice parameter change? When an element dissolves into it. Okay. So, you see that the peak shift occurs only when the broadening crosses a critical value. That means, when the crystallite size reaches a critical value. Till then, the peak does not shift and the solubility is 0. This is true irrespective of the composition that you choose. For example, here 30 percent zinc, 40 percent zinc, 50 percent zinc, three different compositions are compared. For all of them, you see the similar plot. Suddenly, there is a jump in the solubility. Okay. So, once you reach that particular critical crystallite size, suddenly you see that zinc starts dissolving into copper and then till then it does not dissolve. This is true even in copper nickel, if you have a look at this, okay. here is an example of one composition, which is ball milled in three different milling uh, media. Okay. That means, the balls and the container that is used is called milling media. Okay. Here, one is tungsten carbide. WC and chrome steel and stainless steel. You may ask why should there be an effect of the milling media? You can see interestingly that if you look at the top one tungsten carbide, you see the peaks of copper and peaks of nickel separately. That clearly tells you that the alloying has not taken place. Copper is 
remaining separately, nickel is remaining separately. The both have not really become an alloy. There is a pure metal mixture of copper and nickel. But if you look at the bottom two, okay, the two peaks have merged into one peak. That means an alloy or solid solution has formed. And if you carefully look at it, the peak broadening here in the bottom two cases is much larger than the peak broadening in the top two cases. That means the crystallite size in the two bottom cases is much smaller than the crystallite size in the top case. In fact, when we have calculated the tungsten carbide case gives you about 200 nanometers, in that bottom two you get about 20 nanometers. Why is this so? This happens basically because when you ball mill in a chrome steel or stainless steel, there is a contamination of iron coming from the balls. When the iron goes into copper and nickel, okay, there is a solid solution strengthening that takes place. Okay. When iron which is con, uh, coming from as a contamination from the balls into the copper powder okay, dissolves into it, immediately there is a solid solution strengthening. Once that happens, the powder particles become more hard. Okay, they become harder and if they become harder, they can break more easily. The, the rate of fracture increases when it becomes harder. So, as a result, you will see when uh, the particle, when there is a contamination, the particles become harder and when they become harder, the grain size decreases more rapidly that you can easily achieve nano crystals in such a condition when compared to tungsten carbide where there is no contamination. And unless you go to lower temperatures, you cannot achieve the low grain size there. Because copper and nickel are ductile materials, usually in ductile materials, the fracturing does not occur very easily. Okay? Only in brittle materials like oxides or um, real brittle materials, you can easily have more and more fracture and finer grain size that can be achieved. So, this is one again indirect proof to show you that nano crystallization is a prerequisite for alloy unless it becomes nano crystal alloying cannot occur. Okay. This has been observed in a number of cases. So, you can see once a material becomes nano crystal, there are so many things happening. Okay. Magnetic properties, okay. physical properties and mechanical properties and even alloying itself okay, is going to change when you go into a nano crystalline regime. So, there are so many fascinating avenues that open up when you go to nano crystal. This is another example to show you. Here, what we have shown is the solubility of uh, silicon in iron as a function of crystallite size, a clear demonstration of how crystallite size again affects the alloying. You see that until you reach around 20 nanometers, the solubility is almost 0. Okay? The silicon solubility in iron is almost 0 up to about 20 nanometers starting from about 100 nanometers. One can even do higher larger sizes, you will see again there, there will be almost no solubility. But once you come below 20 nanometers, there is a sudden raise in the solubility and as you go to lower and lower sizes, there is more and more solubility. And you also see a dotted line here and dotted line is nothing but the volume fraction of the grain boundaries, calculated volume fraction of the grain boundaries. As I told you, one can calculate once you uh, know the grain size, assuming a certain thickness for the grain boundary, yesterday we talked about it, what is the volume fraction of the grain boundaries, which is 3 delta by d approximately. Okay? So, that 3 delta by d, if we can use that formula, one can calculate the uh, how that uh, volume fraction of the grain boundaries changes and that more or less goes almost in the same fashion. So, that means this increase in the uh, solubility can be directly attributed to the increase in the grain boundary volume fraction. In fact, the, uh, the difference between these two curves is basically because of our assumption that the delta, which is the grain boundary thickness is constant throughout the regime. In principle, if one can uh, consider the variation of the grain boundary thickness as a function of the grain size itself, we know that as grain size decreases, grain boundary thickness increases. If one can consider that, the, these two curves will almost merge, but there is no real evidence available on how the grain boundary thickness varies with the, uh, the grain size. Though people know theoretically it should be uh, increasing with decreasing grain size, but the actual numbers are not available. So, as a result at the moment 
we have only used a fixed grain, uh, uh, grain boundary thickness and with that you can still see that there is a clear uh, one to one co uh, uh, correlation between the grain boundary volume fraction to the solubility. And there is another interesting phenomena that one can observe when you go to nano regime, particularly when intermetallic compounds are formed. Okay. Here is an example of two intermetallic compounds, one is an Al3 Ni compound, another is a Al Ni compound. When you look at these two compounds, okay, what you see interestingly is that, that when you uh, start ball milling, okay, aluminum and nickel together, choosing the composition which is shown there, one gives you Al3 Ni uh, phase, another gives you Al Ni phase. Okay, you choose the composition accordingly so that you get these two phases. And what you see is that the, the uh, crystallite size of aluminum and the crystallite size of nickel decrease continuously and you can see that crystallite size of nickel is smaller than that of aluminum, okay, which is again corresponding to what I have told you earlier that nickel having a higher melting point, it will have a lower crystallite size than aluminum having a lower melting point. Okay. So, but what is more interesting here is not that fact. The more interesting thing is that once the two crystallite sizes reach a critical value, suddenly there is a reaction between the nickel and aluminum. So, what you see here is that if you think of the nickel aluminum, nickel aluminum alternate layers which form during ball milling, you always know that the nickel and aluminum both of them are refined, made finer and when a ball hits a ductile uh, powder particle, it immediately becomes a flake and these flakes get adhered to each other and form what are like a uh, sandwich kind of a structure. And within this sandwich structure, when the crystallite size becomes very fine, there is a sudden reaction between these two and then formation of a compound that occurs. But this occurs exactly at a critical crystallite size and that is what you see here, this is what we call it as discontinuous additive mixing, okay. Because there is a discontinuity in the crystallite size there and there is a kind of an addition of the two crystallite sizes and the crystallite size of the intermetallic that is coming out is equivalent to the summation of the two crystallite sizes. That means, if you assume two layers and the two layers react with each other and you have an intermetallic compound forming and its crystallite size is, is nothing but the summation of these two crystallite sizes. Okay. And this is what is called discontinuous mixing and this is observed in all ordered intermetallic compounds with a large negative enthalpy of mixing. And in fact, we have also seen that the higher the negative enthalpy of mixing, we all know the, that if the enthalpy of mixing of a compound, if it is higher it has a greater driving force for forming, is not it? When the enthalpy of mixing of an intermetallic compound is large, we can say its driving force is large. And if it has a large driving force for its formation, it can form even at a coarser crystallite size. So, that means this critical size is a function of the delta H mixing of the compound. That if the compound has a low enthalpy of mixing, you need to take the particles to lower and lower sizes for the intermetallic co compound to form, which may not be possible under normal milling conditions that you may have to do probably cryo milling. But if the, uh, the enthalpy of mixing is very largely negative, then even under normal conditions at a larger crystallite size itself, you may be able to make these compounds. And we have done a number of cases and we have seen that if the compound is disordered, you do not have this kind of a uh, situation that here is an example where we have taken an aluminum nickel and put chromium and iron into it. The moment you put chromium and iron of a particular concentration, it becomes disordered. Once it becomes disordered, it behaves like a solid solution. There is no discontinuous additive mixing kind of thing. Then the what you see is that with decreasing crystallite size, once the crystallite size reaches below a certain value, there is a continuous shift of the peaks and a continuous solubility that occurs and there is no reaction and formation of a new, new compound. Okay. So, this is one of the uh, major changes that you see when you go from an ordered compound to a disordered compound. Disordered compounds are behave like solid solutions, ordered compounds where reactive mixing occurs. This is similar to self propagating high temperature synthesis. 
you must have heard of some of the people might have heard of what is called self propagating hydrogen pressure synthesis where you take individual elements heat them to high temperature and immediately they both of them react with each other and when there is a reaction between each other then the compound forms when the compound forms then a enthalpy is released because this is an exothermic reaction and when there is a release of enthalpy that enthalpy will help in the further transformation of the remaining material so that it is it is a self propagating wave okay once the wave is ignited okay once the reaction is initiated then the energy that is released uh, will be sufficient to overcome the activation barrier for the rest of the material to get ignited and you have a continuous formation of these intermetallic compounds a number of such intermetallic compounds are being made uh, with uh, uh, this kind of a process but here the interesting thing is everything is happening at room temperature just because you are making it into nano here it is not happening because you are igniting it with high temperature no we are not igniting it the ignition is taking place because of the crystallite size being very low where the surface area to volume ratio is so high that ignition occurs automatically because of the nano crystallite size so you can see that nano crystallization is again a kind of a first step for such a ignition to occur and formation of such compounds and this has been proved in a number of cases you can see here this is a kind of a summation of a study on a number of systems that you see that as long as they are ordered okay you have a discontinuous relative mixing and they, if they are disordered you have a continuous relative mixing we'll stop here and continue in the next class